Jim. How are you doing? Good evening, Denise. I'm doing fine. That's good. So I'm very happy to finally meet you in person. That's a, uh, well, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm glad you're doing research in this area. Yeah. <laughs> and so my first question, we're going to start in the beginning. Okay. I want to know where you were born. I was born in Highland Park, Illinois. My family moved out uh, to the West, to New Mexico in uh, the 1960s. Uh, in Santa Rosa, New Mexico, on the Pecos River. And that's when I really became interested in rocks and geology and hydrology. When I was a young boy and, and uh, fishing and swimming in the sinkholes and in the rivers of eastern New Mexico. And what did you do for fun then as a kid there? Um, well, we played in quarries. We played in the sinkholes, you know, the... Uh, in the water, the springs were coming up, and there we could see the fish swimming and all those sort of things. And so I was uh, a, a teenager just entering my teens, and my family moved to Colorado and a uh, short time in Moab, Utah, and I became more interested in rocks and the outdoors. And uh, eventually uh, I went to college in uh, Grand Junction, Colorado, and uh, studied forestry, and later on I graduated with a degree in environmental geology. And was that in Colorado also? Yes, that was in Colorado. And from Colorado, where did you go next? Well, um, I went into the Army, and I came back out of the Army. I got married. I, after I had my undergraduate degree, we looked around for work, and we came back down here to Arizona in the Phoenix area where my wife was from and I found uh, work with the state uh, land department doing water rights and field investigations. And how was that working in water rights during that time? And it, to me it was fascinating because I went all over the state. I traveled over 45,000 miles in one year and going around looking at stock ponds, looking at wells, measuring wells, groundwater, uh, surface water resources, uh, and it was predated a lot of the agencies we see today. So it, it's a very small community in, in water with hydrologists, both surface and groundwater hydrologists. And so were you the person that kind of sees how people are allocate, are using their water? Well, yeah, the water rights uh, program, this was before the Department of Water Resources was created. Um, yes, I mean, you had to have permission to uh, use the water, surface water, and the allocations for whether it was for agriculture or mining or for municipal use. Uh, the groundwater was just starting to be regulated then in the Groundwater Management Act of 1980. And so people were registering their wells, recording how much they pumped, both down in the Tucson area and here in, in Maricopa County and in uh, Pinal County, the active management areas. And in all three of those areas, the groundwater was uh, being withdrawn at a faster rate than it was being replenished. So we had su active subsidence of the land surface. And that later created uh, fissures and uh, sinkholes and things of that nature that create problems for highways and for pipelines and that sort of thing. But they regulated the permission to withdraw the water. And basically, you, the water was still a property of the state, the groundwater as well as the surface water. You didn't own it. You only had a right to use it. And nobody had a right to pollute it. And so from that uh, work that you did, how did you then enter the Arizona Department of Health Services? Or was there anything in between that you want to talk no, about? No, I, I was recruited from uh, by the Health Department uh, to come work on a program, uh, a safe drinking water program in, in the Department of Health Services. And they had limited funding. It was from the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act to look at the potential impact uh, to drinking water supplies from surface impoundments uh, used to store, treat, or dispose of liquid waste. And so the program was for uh, about two years, and so we didn't have a lot of people that were willing to do that, but I was working on my graduate degree part-time at that time, 
So it sounded interesting. So I went to work for the Department of Health Services as a hydrologist. And Jim, can you tell me what exactly you were responsible then for at, when you were recruited to the Arizona Department of Health Services? Sure, I was recruited because, uh, number one, I knew uh, a lot of the areas around the state because I'd worked for the state land department uh, looking at surface and groundwater resources. And uh, the department was also interested at that time in um, finding a safe disposal site for hazardous waste. And I'd done a lot of field work with another hydrologist uh, in, in one of the areas in, in uh, western Maricopa County, uh, Harquahela uh, Valley. And so the health department was interested in that site. And so I had some more knowledge that would be applicable if they chose that as a disposal site. So there were a couple reasons, but the primary reason was to do the surface impoundment assessment uh, using the uh, federal uh, evaluation method and then write a report. And so that's very interesting when I learn what you did, especially it's out of the Arizona Department of Health Services. Well, it's a drinking water program. And, you know, even today, uh, Millions of people die from waterborne illnesses. And in the United States, we have very few people that ever die from waterborne illnesses, uh, at least in the, in the U.S. And uh, so we tend to forget, but it is a serious health issue around the world and particularly uh, drinking water sources. And we've always thought that the groundwater was perfect and the land would filter it, but that's simply not the case with all contaminants and with all uh, methods of withdrawing the groundwater and putting it into the drinking water systems. And so can you talk a little bit about what you did then when it came to the surface impoundment work all over the state of Arizona and then maybe focusing into the Tucson area? Sure. Uh, what we did with, with uh, the surface pound as assessment was first sent out some sort of survey form all over to all sorts of people using standard industrial classification to all the manufacturing people, you know, whether they packaged eggs, whether they were dairy farmers, whether they're mining industry, uh, the electronics industry, to the cities, towns, counties with the uh, wastewater treatment plants. Just everybody. We sent out literally hundreds, and if not thousands, of questionnaires and asked people to fill out this questionnaire that asked about what sort of waste it was and how big their impoundments were, if they had any, those sort of things. And we got a pretty good response in some areas, and in other areas we didn't. And then we went ahead and took that information, did a desktop uh, survey uh, evaluation, and, you know, how deep was the groundwater in, in that area and what was the condition of their surface impoundment and what type of liquid waste did they put in these surface impoundments. And so you went to every individual, like you said, it didn't matter if it was a dairy farm to the industrial, just looking specifically at these impoundment areas. It or it, yes, it, it was still, but it was an office survey at that time. And so, uh, no, did, we, we may have done, it's, it's been a while, that was 1978. And so that's, you know, over 40, 40 years ago. And so I don't remember if we did a lot of field checking, uh, sampling, whether it was a dairy impoundment or a wastewater treatment plant or, or a sludge disposal facility for uh, a wastewater plant. Um, but we looked at the, the higher potential sites based upon the types of waste products that they were disposing of. And then we looked at the depth of groundwater. And many of the sites, uh, they scored in the medium range. A couple of them were higher uh, because we knew the groundwater was fairly shallow and susceptible. And we also knew, based on a few studies, that the groundwater was contaminated, whether it was from mining waste or from other uh, situations. And what was your next step after that when you started learning? 
Well, we, we started looking at um, groundwater uh, quality, laboratory quality testing in, in, through the Safe Drinking Water Program. People had turned in, and we realized that that at those days, and under the Safe Drinking Water Program in, in Arizona, uh, they would test a well once or twice, and then very infrequently after that. And we looked at that and said, that's probably not sufficient. Let's ask some more questions. And so we really started t going into the information and asking other hydrologists uh, that we knew in the state and uh, drinking water uh, people in the program, do you know of any contamination? Or do you know of any elevated levels of these sort of contaminants? And in those days we were focused, in the very beginning we were just focused on inorganic materials. We hadn't yet started to focus on the other uh, 119 uh, priority pollutants or the EPA pollutants at that time. And our laboratories couldn't even sample for many of those uh, chlorinated uh, organic compounds. And so the technology has changed quite a bit. Oh, dramatically, <laughs> dramatically. <laughs> it, you know, we didn't, we didn't have many of the things like we have today, you know, to where we would locate these wells. We'd have to kind of figure it out and draw it on the map and kind of guess, is this the registration for this well? And, you know, so we could look at the at the well drillers logs and figure out where are the formations, where's the water and these sort of things. And so today I know within, you know, five or 10 feet of, you know, when I go to a well site using my GPS, actually just using my phone, I can figure out what it is. And so the technology is dramatically different than what it was 40 years ago. And so... Yeah, and how, so then after you did this, how did you um, come upon the Tucson site? Uh, well, we got some information, uh, either through the drinking water program or from a hydrologist, that uh, one of the wells in the Tucson airport area had some elevated chromium in it. And that's unusual here in the alluvial basins. Uh, and so we don't tend to see that. We do see it in some mining areas where there's minerals and things. So it was kind of a questionable sort of thing. South of Tucson at the, at the copper mines, yeah, we might see some of those inorganic metals that would show up. But chromium was typically not found in the other drinking water wells in the, in the Tucson area. And so we thought, you know, is there an issue here? And looking at the uh, types of waste and looking at uh, how the wastes were being disposed of at, at the Hughes Aircraft uh, Facility, Air Force Plant 44, um, we started asking more questions and sampling uh, more. And so did you directly approach then the plant or the Hughes, or how did that go? Yes, in fact, we did. We said, you know, we think that the, the groundwater may be uh, being impacted by your waste management practices. And, you know, we're, that's part of our, our grant that we had to write about contamination or potential contamination. And so we uh, talked to Hughes Aircraft, and they said, well, first off, it's Air Force Plant 44. We just operate it for the Air Force. And so, we, you know, we had sent them some uh, the first draft of, of that little section in a couple paragraphs. And so we, we changed it. We met with the uh, folks, and they said, "Why do you think it's us?" You know, <laughs> and we said, "Well, that's you know the nature of waste. They do percolate through the ground, and there's large volume that you disposed of over the years, and from from what we understood." But they were fairly concerned that they were being singled out. And we said, look, we're doing an industrial site, we're doing a mining site, we're doing an agricultural site. You know, we need examples, and, and unfortunately, this looks pretty suspicious to us. And so we continued on, and despite their complaints, you know, to our management, and our management was good. They backed us up because it was drinking water. And, you know, that's where the health department. So I was very pleased with that. Um, 
but it was it was hard because my training, my experience working with 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 groundwater and, and working with geology was it was fairly apparent to me that something was going on as a result of man's activity and it wasn't naturally occurring. So when I started relating this to uh, the US EPA, EPA became more interested. And they said, well, is there something we can help you with? And so they did help us with the, uh, uh, the laboratory testing of the water. And in the beginning, it was just the water. And we would collect samples from wells in the Tucson airport area. And we put them in, uh, on ice and send them, ship them out of the state. And for many years, you know, I'd collected a lot of samples of water around the state. So I'd done more uh, groundwater contamination removal than anybody else until they got the big systems in place. But our labs couldn't do it here. And so we just pumped gallons and gallons and uh, sent it out of state to the labs. And EPA, you know, thought that was humorous, but they put more money into their program and, and the technology in the laboratory, the detection levels for chlorinated solvents and other contaminants. So that's very interesting because it seems that then they focused uh, the advancements of certain technologies because of this? They did. Uh, two things. One was getting qualified laboratories to test for the types of contaminants they were starting to find all over the country in different places. And so to develop that tech, local technology, uh, number one. And number two, well, what if we see this in the groundwater, what's in the soil? And so that started kind of the next phase of the EPA involvement in the Tucson airport area after we uh, completed our draft report in 1979, in fact, it was December 7th, 1979, Pearl Harbor Day. And, but we never went beyond the draft stages in the report. We were out of money, we had to move on. But EPA then became interested in sampling soils. And so we sampled soils um, um, in the Tucson airport area, in the drainages, um, downstream from the industrial areas, uh, in the fire pits, uh, in the training pits right on the airport property itself. I remember drilling and sampling there and uh, on the active flight line. And so that was exciting uh, and dangerous. And we would never do that today, but we did it then wearing full gear uh, respirators and suits and things. And so that's a little different than uh, how we investigate today. And so we were, but we didn't have any standards. We didn't have any knowledge of how to do these things. So we're, we were kind of at the forefront of developing this, this, this technology to sample. Uh, so I used backhoes. We used a lot of, uh, uh, augers, hollow stem augers, where the auger is bores the hole, and on the inside you can take a sample of the soil and bring it back up to the surface. And so we bored some pretty deep holes for hollow stem augers on these small soil rigs that typically don't go much deeper than 25 feet or so. And we were down 125 feet in some of those areas and still didn't find groundwater. And which is good because the deeper uh, the groundwater elevations are, or the distance to groundwater, the more chance of the soil and the alluvial material grabbing onto the contaminants and holding it. Uh, but chlorinated solvents behave a lot differently. They're designed to move and take wash off. Uh, uh, basically grease from the manufacturing process. And in the Tucson airport area, um, we came to find out that, that after uh, World War II, II and um, airplanes were put in mothballs and they were covered with uh, a material to protect the metal and those sort of things. But when Korea started 
uh, the Korean War started in the early 50s, they were taken out of storage. They were washed off with chlorinated solvents on cement pads, and um, something happened with that wash water, the wash water and the solvents, and it went somewhere. And so we started finding um, in the soils, we started finding chlorinated solvents that we knew couldn't just be from the Air Force Plant 44. And um, when we were talking the, uh, when we first uh, met, you mentioned that you had a partners that you work with. I don't know if you want to talk a lot a bit about who you work with sure. in the project, your field partners and the agencies that you collaborated with. Sure. Um, uh, in, in the surface pattern assessment report, James Angel was uh, had just graduated from the U of A. He was a young hydrologist and in, from the Tucson area. And uh, so he and I worked together. And I did most of my work in the northern part of Arizona, and he did most of his work in the southern part of Arizona because he's more familiar with it. And uh, But we did a lot of field work together, particularly after uh, Air Force Plant 44, Hughes Aircraft. You know, we, we wrote that part of the report together. And so I wrote it about another site up here in Maricopa County, um, the Motorola plant uh, here in the North Indian Men Wash Superfund site, similar sorts of things. And so, But what's interesting about the Tucson Airport area, there were a number of other industries in aircraft manufacturing and electronics plants uh, all around the Tucson Airport area. And they all use chlorinated solvents. Some of them did plating work. And so there are a variety of these chemicals that we're starting to see turning up in the drinking water uh, at the various wells in Tucson. And in those days, the only source of, of water, uh, drinking water in Tucson, was, was the aquifer. And it you know, was classified as a sole source aquifer, meaning there was no other uh, place for drinking water. And so it, it deserved higher protection. So we got more support, the health department got more support from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, uh, the drinking water program, as well as their beginning of their um, the RICRA program and the Superfund program. And we also got support from um, uh, what was the, uh, the Department of Water Resources that came about, their hydrologists helped on giving us some information on the wells. They weren't really into water quality, it was water quantity. And those were um, interesting days. They didn't have a lot of resources, so we all collaborated. And also the hydrologists and the technical people working with the, uh, in Tucson at Tucson Water saying we sampled this, we changed our sampling schedule and these sort of areas. And we started also with uh, here in the, the Phoenix area with the water departments. We saw a lot more collaboration in those days. And later on when it became apparent that they had served contaminated water to their customers, we didn't get as much cooperation. And so I don't know if that's changed, but I think they're much more uh, vigilant in what they what they do, what they pump, and how they serve it. And uh, can you talk about uh, the scoring ma matrix that you um, used in order when you're looking at all the different surface impoundments? Uh, can you just talk a little bit about how you scored them? Um, and th and then in addition, how the uh, Tucson site fared. Well, I wish I could remember. Uh, one of the, one of the scoring matrix was, you know, how deep is it to groundwater? And of course, most of our sites here in the, in the Basin Range Province, with you know hundreds of feet to depth to groundwater, so that part of the scoring matrix always scored poorly. The part where we looked at the uh, the impoundments, all the impoundments uh, didn't have liners in them. So there wasn't anything to prevent the disappearance of all that waste down into the earth. But we also had a very high evapor evapotranspiration rate, evaporation rate. And so a lot of the water, the things that were the driving forces were not there. So there's, a, I can't remember 
all of the details and what scored higher and lower, but it was a humid hydrologic rating scheme, and it was not designed for the arid southwest. And that we became apparent even after we'd gone to the national training and and other folks said, yes, we know, but, you know, so much of the country, you know, they have these small drinking water systems and wells, and you guys are different. And we said, yes, we are. And so I think that's why we got more interest from Region 9 EPA. It's, 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 the West, there's so much of the West here in the Basin and Range province that relies upon groundwater. You know, maybe we ought to look at this a little bit differently. And so I think that's why we had more interest from Fred Hoffman, was a uh, geologist with U.S. Uh, EPA in San Francisco, and Fred used to, and I were, became quite quite good friends because we were pushing the technology of sampling and and looking at our our geology and our hydrology and the man land treatments of what we were doing with this water and how we could do better. And so whether we are investigating landfills or we're investigating surface impoundments, you know, I work quite closely with Region 9, and they're very supportive. And can you also describe some of the aerial work that you did? Well, one of the things that, uh, that I did a lot of work with when I was at the State Land Department, when we we're doing water rights and looking at the... Uh, um, how agriculture and, mine, and mining folks were using their water, we, we would verify the, the irrigation non-expansion areas. We used aerial photography. And so I was quite comfortable using aerial photography to look at what's happening and then using the, the pictures historically. And Arizona is blessed with a very open uh, cloudless uh, terrain and it's fairly easy to fly. So there's a lot of aerial photography that was taken historically. So we could see whether it was uh, Tucson Airport area, Air Force Plant 44, we could see the expansion and those sort of things. And, and of course today we see that on Google Earth and you can go back and look at that. But at those times you, you had to go to the vaults and so I spent a lot of time going to the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, here in the Phoenix area. And Dr. Herman Bauer was the one that did tremendous amounts of work on groundwater contamination and groundwater movement. He wrote many textbooks, very professional papers uh, on groundwater and uh, did a very famous uh, research project here in Phoenix called Flushing Meadows. And it was down in along the Salt River, Salt Gila River system, and he was using sewage effluent and recharging and, and how and then sampling at various depths. How deep did, did the alluvial material have to be to filter all this out? And so we you know, we came up and had to be at least ten meters, thirty feet deep, to filter out these biological contaminants but not the other things that are in sewage effluent. And because those aren't treated, you know, at the biological treatment stations. And we saw that problem uh, here in the Indian Bend Wash area, that there were small water, uh, wastewater treatment plants in South Scottsdale. And all it did was take out the biological sorts of things and the organic sludge, and it really didn't treat that. And then it was uh, put into ponds, impoundments, that then drained into, into the aquifer. And we started seeing groundwater contamination in the Indian Bend Wash area in our drinking water wells. So it became quite apparent to those of us that were working in this part of the, the science that we could not count on 10 meters of, of soil and, and, and sand to filter out these industrial contaminants. It might work for the heavy metals, which don't are not very mobile in the system, but the organic solvents just zip on through. And so were these all the techniques that you used uh, in the, T so the Tucson site to kind of put together this puzzle that you were? Well, yes, I mean, Tucson was our, our kind of our, our field laboratory. We were sampling. First, we sampled the soils in the drainages, the sediments that came off 
the properties, looking for contaminants and going and then sampling upstream or starting upstream and then working downstream uh, as as the drainages went towards the uh, San Pedro River and looking at those sort of things. So off of the Tucson Airport area and and further uh, downstream towards the uh, Toho Odom Reservation, I believe. Uh, and so we sampled ditches and we looked at sludge and s slimy stuff. And then some folks at the University of Arizona got interested. Dr. Gray Wilson was the hydrologist. And so, but he, he found out some folks that were interested in soils and contaminants in soils. And so they came out to the field and we were drilling and they would take a sample and they actually brought, a, uh, brought with them a gas chromatograph in the back of a a van and they put the samples in and they were testing them and doing these things. And so I, I would, you know, today we have handheld devices to do it. This, but back then it, it took a whole van load of equipment to do this, but we were pushing the envelope. We were developing new techniques. So it was fun. It was exciting. And for those of us, I was going to graduate school and, and to see our work and it was appreciated by the US EPA and we're developing sampling techniques. We're developing field laboratory uh, uh, techniques, skill sets. How do we protect the samples so that they don't lose any of their volatile properties and those sort of things. And uh, it was different, it was different. And so we felt like we advanced the science. Now we didn't write a lot of papers we didn't do a lot of reports. Uh, we ended up with sample results because we were looking for the sources of the contamination and how far had it spread. So we constantly were taking samples of water from wells when we'd get some money to uh, ship, ship the samples to the EPA laboratories and they had the funding. And so we, we sampled wells all over Tucson in the Phoenix metropolitan area. Okay. Okay. So now, so now you did all of that interesting field work. You're innovating the how not only do you take the samples, but also how you analyze them, all the technology behind that. And you had to write a report in the end, right? Well, yes. We, I mean, we did write a report for the surface impoundment assessment. We wrote some, probably some technical memos or shorter memos about what we were finding, but most of the time it was, are we seeing contamination? Where are we seeing the contamination? What is the contamination? And so there were not a lot of detailed reports because it was, you know, kind of a, a new experimental process that we were involved in. You know, we were, we were treasure seekers, if you will, uh, looking for, is there a, a magic way to do this? Are we going to find this gold mine or, or this, this, uh, this place with all the contamination coming out? And what we find is typical uh, in many industrial areas. We find, you know, little hot pockets of contamination here and there. But we didn't have a lot of sampling um, money. And so we would try and, and do some field investigation, just kind of look around with our, our shovels and say, is this a more practical place to sample? We can only take a few samples. We only have limited funds to have a backhoe or, or a, a drilling rig. You know, where are we going to go? And so we're really, um, it was a very biased sampling process. The most likely place uh, to look and see what might be there. And so today, uh, in the work that I do, we wouldn't do it that way. We would screen, well, unless we're screening the sites out and looking in, in, with limited amounts of money, but we would be a, take a much broader sampling approach and, and take more samples and try and characterize the site a lot, a lot better and focus on, on a smaller site area. But we focused on the entire Tucson airport area. That's, you know, several miles. And so there are lots of different areas to that and lots of different types of potential contamination. And what were some of the findings that 
you uh, concluded? Well, we 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 found uh, TCE, found TCA, we found breakdown products uh, from that. We found some heavy metals, not many, but we did find some in some areas. Um, so we found uh, different chlorinated solvents both in the soil at, at some levels, but it was harder to test the soil because you had to extract uh, the, the contaminants from the, from the soil. And so it was the order of magnitude less precise than what we were seeing in the drinking water. Um, you know, it, it's, it's been a long time. <laughs> and then how did the US EPA, um, you mentioned that they came in, they provided kind of this analysis component of it. What other things did they do with you? Well, they were interested after we had done the, the sampling of, this, of the groundwater and the waters of the different wells. We knew that the wells were contaminated, contaminated with TCE. Tucson Water shut down those drinking water wells that were contaminated. Uh, we were in the parts per million range in those days, uh, and so they had a, a level of, of five parts per million. If it was more contaminated than that, they'd shut the well down. Um, and because the laboratories could not consistently test uh, below uh, about a half a part per million on chlorinated solvents or TCE. And so we focused on TCE throughout the state and some of our interim policies were based on that. Uh, but we knew that laboratories were working in, in getting into the part per billion range, but we just didn't have enough information about uh, the health consequences and so that was the five part per million was the action level. And I'm not sure what it is today, but that was the issue then. And we were, it was a health agency. It wasn't a pollution control agency uh, like, like today's Department of Environmental Quality is. Um, but EPA was thinking, well, what about aerial photography if, or aerial investigation? For some of these sites because they're big sites. And so EPA uh, said, would you be interested in investigating your high priority sites from the surface impoundment assessment report uh, through an aerial photo mission? And so uh, worked with people out of uh, EPA's office uh, there in Colorado, um, I think in Lakewood. And aerial photo folks, and you know, and of course, in those days, uh, the aerial photo experts were, had all come from the military. And so I remember working, I can't remember Jerry's last name, but he'd been in the Air Force for many, many years, and uh, analyzing the uh, aerial imagery from the U 2 spy planes. And so he was very interested in. Uh, in uh, the military bases and uh, in doing a photo mission with us. And so we, they came here to Arizona and we did photo missions of, of mining sites, uh, the industrial sites here in the uh, Phoenix area. We flew down to Yuma and looked at some agricultural sites. We flew down to Tucson and looked at those uh, Tucson airport and the mining sites. Um, I remember we were up in the uh, Globe Miami area over the smelters and we flew through, you know, we couldn't, we didn't know, but we flew through the plume from the smelter and everybody started coughing and, you know, that sort of thing. And it was, you know, eyes were burning, you know, so we couldn't see these contaminants, but we knew there were airborne contaminants. And, and in those days, the theory was the solution to pollution is dilution. So you disperse it. And you give it to every a little bit to everybody, and you hope the cloud disperses. If it's an air contaminant, if it's in the drinking water, you hope that it's it's dispersed out at smaller levels. A little dose will be okay. And so today we don't subscribe to that as much as we did, but we still do it, and which is unfortunate in my opinion. But that's you know 
we, we can absorb as humans quite a bit of environmental insults and contamination. And did you ever uh, present your results uh, in the end to the responsible parties or how did you interact with them when you were seeing what was going on? You know, we probably did uh, informally. I think um, when the responsible parties became aware that they were responsible parties, the collaboration wasn't as close. Uh, with Hughes Aircraft, they allowed us to sample into their areas. They had some security issues in some of the areas, and and they had to check out who was doing the work, the drillers and myself and, and others. Um, uh, the same with uh, active areas of the, of the Tucson airport on the runway. Again, security issues. And the runway was shared by, uh, uh, I forgot, the, uh, the Air Force, uh, whatever, the, the planes that they were refurbishing, not from Davis Moffat, but, but from... Uh, uh, a test, an engine test facility down there, and so there were security issues involved, and so it took a little time, but we got permission to investigate. Uh, here in the uh, uh, Motorola situations in Indian Ben Wash, Motorola was a little more forthcoming about trying to work and find out what, do we have a problem, and so we collaborated a little bit more closely with them, and we. Sh shared split samples and those sort of things. We did the same thing with Tucson. We would take a sample and we'd split it in half and provide it to them if they wanted to keep it and sample it. But it, they didn't share as much information as Motorola was sharing. And um, is there anything else that you uh, want to talk about when it comes to all of that work? Uh, that you did with collaboration. I don't know. Uh, one of the things that I thought was interesting when I was looking at the archives mm -hmm. that you have is that you collaborated with Ty Gañez. Uh, and I thought that, and he was part of the hazardous waste. Ty, yeah, Ty worked for the Department of Health Services. Uh, and he was, he had a, uh, his undergraduate degree was in chemistry, I believe, a very bright man. And he he uh, he was from Tucson, and uh, Ty ran the hazardous waste program, um, and I don't know if we really had much of a hazardous waste program in those days. But but af after about four or five years, yes, we did. We had inspectors, we had people that were trained, and they started doing the RICRA program, the hazardous waste program, subtitles. Uh, C and D. And one was landfills and solid waste. The other was hazardous waste program. So in those days, but Ty was the, had the background in chemistry, and also the background from the Tucson area where he grew up, and so he was with the Department of Health Services for many many years. So. And were you interviewed by Jane K for her article that came out in '85? I think it was. Oh sure. I mean you know we. I, Talked to a number of reporters, you know. I can remember uh, when I was sampling uh, drinking water wells and, you know, there's the water contaminated. I can remember television crews following us around, watching us take a sample of water. And so, yeah, I talked to a number of reporters, uh, both on camera and in both print. And did you ever talk to community members? Did anybody approach you? We had various meetings. Sometimes they were sponsored by the Department of Health Services. Sometimes, uh, I don't know whether EPA uh, sponsored the meetings or not. Uh, Tucson, City of Tucson, uh, Tucson Water sponsored some meetings. You know, this is what we're finding. This is what we know. This is what we know about our quality of water. Those sort of things. And we were always there. And I'm sure there are community members that asked us questions. You know, are you poisoning us? And of course, the official answer is no, we never intentionally tried to do anything to hurt anybody. And once we found out that our wells were contaminated, we shut them down. But we still have to provide fire protection and water in the system. And so that's kind of some of the issues. And many of the systems didn't have the redundancy built in so they could pump water from somewhere else. So it took some time to uh, get some of those things in place so they could pump from a different area 
and not pump from contaminated wells. So I think there, and sometimes they were advised, as I recall, uh, sometimes some of the contamination we were finding had high nitrates, like from, from sewage treatment plants. And so when, when babies get, get that, they get this kind of blue, blue baby syndrome is, is what I'm remembering now. And so you wanna make sure that the nitrates aren't real high in the water. And so uh, parents were, were advised, moms were advised, not to serve that particular water to the you know to their babies or mix the formula with that and to use uh, bottled water and so we looked at the bottled water plants in those days and we found uh, many of the glass bottles that the water was coming in had been rinsed with uh, TCE <laughs> to degrease them and so my uh, my thought was that quickly changed. But in those days, there were big glass five-gallon jugs that were delivered. And so that quickly changed when the health department found out what was really going on in the industry. And so, and so that's why you see today much more of the recycled plastic bottles than you do see glass bottles because of contamination issues. So that's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, we changed the industry. Yeah. We changed the industry, and because we we're concerned about potential pathways to contamination, we regulated very strictly what was put into the drinking water uh, systems, but we didn't re regulate bottled water. And everybody started drinking bottled water. And you're right, that's not a reg, even still now, from what I understand, it's not very much. Yeah. And uh, one of the questions that when we're talking is that you mentioned that you, all your work, this was very, obviously this was, you started in the 70s from what I understand. Yes. And then it went into the 80s. And yes. And that's when the litigation started happening for the site. And did you, you mentioned to me that you had to present some of the work that you did at these court hearings. Right. Um, well, the, the Resource Conservation Recovery Act uh, was just starting out in the late 70s, and we had done this surface impoundment assessment process and contaminated drinking water through the Safe Drinking Water Act. And then it, it uh, with the reauthorization of RICRA and much more uh, robust program with hazardous waste, subtitles uh, C and D, uh, in the early 80s, we, they started regulating the waste um, and then looking at the drinking water and the contamination, the, uh, there was more concern about well, what's happening, who's responsible, who's going to pay to clean this up. And that's when Superfund started coming in vogue. Uh, and that's a different regulatory program, the, the CERCLA program. And I remember telling the federal people, uh, Fred, I said, you know, after Love Canal, where they took the uh, the public employees hostage until the governor promised to do something about the Love Canal situation, I, um, I told Fred, I said, Arizona's kind of independent. You know, we don't negotiate with hostages. You know, so you may be here a long time. And uh, he, he said, what do you mean? I said, we don't negotiate, you know. <laughs> So we can't guarantee your safety if you go to these contaminated communities. And he was kind of struck by that. And then, of course, we had a good relationship. And, of course, that wasn't true, but but he got to thinking about it. And he thought, this is serious stuff. And it is. People's lives depend upon it. People are being in, impacted. Their homes, they can't sell their homes in these contaminated areas. And so we were doing a lot of work all over the state when we started seeing contaminated wells and have it, had a testing program for these contamination. And so it wasn't just in Tucson Airport area, although that was in, in Tucson. We did see other contamination around landfills, uh, Ina Road landfill, the Rogers Road uh, treatment plant landfill. We see contamination plumes that are still, still there today as is the contamination in the Tucson airport area. It takes decades to clean that up, to pump and treat. And did you ever think that, um, or did you ever expect that the work that you did in Southside Tucson or 
even in the beginning when you were hired for this work, that it would lead to the establishment of this really, uh, I guess it's a fundamental case study of environmental justice that's known nationwide. And even Motorola 52nd too is another one. Did you realize that this was gonna happen? No, not, not at all. I, I was focused on protecting people, protecting people's drinking water, protecting that state resource from further damage from people that didn't know what they were doing or maybe they knew and didn't care. And I think that the Superfund program, CERCLA, started looking at responsible parties. If you could find one responsible party, then they had to pay for all the cleanup. And so what we saw was these potentially responsible parties trying to find others. And we saw Hughes Aircraft do that quite, quite effectively. Uh, find the other people, go look over here. And they used to say, here's some information. Go look at, you know, we talked to our employees, go look. And so we did and we, you know, they got more and more people. And um, besides the community meetings that you mentioned, mm -hmm. that you interacted with community members, were there other interactions? Like there was uh, some groups like the Tucson or the TC subcommittee, Tucson is for a clean environment, and then other organizations that were occurring in the 80s. Did you ever interact with them? Probably not a lot. Uh, I, I didn't. Our public information officers probably did from the Department of Health Services. Uh, my managers probably did. Our assistant directors would go to meetings. I used to complain. I said, you know, there's seven, seven layers of people above me, you know, and I'm the only one doing the field work, you know, <laughs> doing the sampling and trying to write a report, you know, and I said, you know, maybe we ought, if I had all seven of those people helping me, we'd get these answers quicker, you know, and of course, that's not how large organizations work. And so a lot of the things that I saw from being familiar with the site, spending a lot of time, uh, doing the sampling and testing, you know, it took them a while to absorb that information. They weren't trained in that area, and it, and we didn't have a lot of resources to help explain that. And, and we were still using manual typewriters in those days, and so I would draft something out. I would used to draft it out an old manual typewriter, and then our typist would type it up neatly in a report format. And I would get my file copy, and in which I kept, you know, because I was the author of that memo. But most of them were one page long, and some some uh, laboratory sample results. And um, just to go back in the litigation, so sure. Were you what type of witness were you? Well, because I'd done the field work uh -huh. and the sampling. Uh, and did the chain of custody on the samples, whether it was drinking water or soils or other materials. Uh, so I was the person responsible. Did, did you sample this? Yes. Tell us about how you sampled it, these sort of things. And, and, uh, and so as litigation started, uh, we were often asked to tell us about your sampling, your chain of custody, these sort of things. And then I was the fact witness as well as the, while I still work for the Department of Health Services, I was their, uh, their expert, if you will, on, on, on groundwater and contamination, soil and groundwater contamination, because my background is in geology. And so I was still, while I was still employed for the Department of Health Services, we did some enforcement actions, typically against uh, landfills, and so we did some court actions where the state attorney general's office uh, sued responsible parties. But very little work in Superfund area because that was a federal program. So that was the fed, federal uh, folks, EPA, that brought those actions about. And what do you want others to know about your role of the Tucson International Airport Area Superfund site? something that might not be well known? Well, it's investigating large areas is expensive and time consuming. Um, you know, the programs today where we do environmental assessment for property transfer work, it really identifies contaminated property 
And so that you just don't pass it on to somebody else and you fix it then or you realize that it's a brownfield or a hazardous waste site or whatever it happens to be. And I think the entire thought about responsible parties, um, we still have responsible parties, but we're doing so much cleanup of contaminated sites now through the private sector because the banks will not lend on contaminated property. And so people are not buying it. And so people that are on the property that's contaminated are cleaning it up. And I spent quite a bit of my time consulting uh, over cleaning up sites for uh, people, investors that were buying property or selling farms or things of that nature. And so a lot more contamination has been cleaned up through those sort of private actions than anything that the regulatory environment has done. But we had to have those test cases, we had to drive it, we had to get out there and do that. But litigation is, is the last resort. You want people to be responsible at the front end. So that's why I've spent the last you know 10 or 15 years concentrating on education. Because if people don't understand what they're doing or what's good or what's bad or how it could harm other folks, uh, they're going to continue to do something that may be risky. And so I think that's where I'd like to focus now, working with children in, in the science, technology, engineering, math, and arts program so that they can be the people of the discovery and preventing the problems and helping to cure them. And when did you stop working at the site? How did you transition to your next job? Sure. Uh, I worked with the Department of Health Services from October of 1978 to November of uh, 1983. Uh, and in 1983, we were starting to investigate um, a number of contamination sites, both with solid waste and hazardous waste. And But we had no money to uh, do the detailed uh, site investigations so that we could uh, require the responsible parties to clean up. So we were identifying problems, but we weren't solving them. And I just spent the last five years identifying problems and we weren't solving any. We were in litigation on some of them, but most of the parties, you know, declared bankruptcy and we weren't cleaning anything up. We were just putting, you know, soil caps on top of, you know, open burning dumps. Um, the, uh, asbestos contamination up in the Globe area, um, Mountain Park Estates. They had built a mobile home park on uh, mine tailings that had a lot of asbestos in them, and the fibers were, you know, in the air. So we just put a big cap over it and just closed the site down and created this area that nobody could live on. You know, to me, that's not a solution. You know, it's avoiding, it's kicking the problem down the road. And, and I don't think that's the way to go. I think we need to clean it up and we need to do that. Uh, rare metals up on the Navajo Reservation north of Tuba City was a, uh, a uranium processing site and there were tailings blowing everywhere and people were living out there. And I pointed that out to EPA and they realized, oh, we didn't know there was anything up there. And then they started doing the, uh, the reclamation of the site. and. I drive by it, they're still doing reclamation up there, sampling the groundwater and doing things, but at least the contamination isn't blowing. And, you know, I grew up in Grand Junction, Colorado, or at least high school, and they used uranium tailings to construct buildings. And so there was radon gas in buildings uh, in my home and those sort of things, and, and or asbestos from the pipes, those sort of things. So there is a lot of risk. Sometimes if you're not paying attention to how the buildings are constructed or where the materials are coming from. Okay, Jim, can you talk a little bit more about after the Arizona Department of Health Services? Certainly, Denise. One, one of the things I, in the fall of 1983, I needed to change. I'd finished my graduate school uh, program at ASU. Uh, my wife had graduated. She was working as an attorney. Uh, here in, in Phoenix, and I thought it's time for maybe another venture. And so I decided uh, 
to start my own uh, small uh, consulting business in uh, land use and, and environmental. And so I left the department and started doing that. And it was a lot of fun. Didn't make much money, but uh, I still worked. But what I, what happened, and I didn't realize when I started, that because I'd done so much work all over the state with the identifying contaminated sites and potentially responsible parties, that I couldn't work for these folks because I had a reputation for telling the truth, whether it hurt the client or helped the client and hurt somebody else. And whether it was an agency or whether uh, it was a big industry. And so I didn't realize that at the time. But uh, and I'm I'm glad I I'm honest. I'm glad that I have that reputation. Uh, in fact, Hughes Aircraft subpoenaed me uh, f- for an action. They were having a dispute with the Air Force about who was supposed to pay for what share of the contamination and get on with it. And so I was flown out to San Francisco, uh, getting ready for the administrative law judge to rule between the Air Force and everything and. And because they knew I would tell the truth. And I was proud of that. You know, I wasn't pleased that I had to go to San Francisco. But uh, but that was the first time that, you know, that I was subpoenaed. And uh, after that, with the toxic tort litigation, whether it was in Tucson or the Indian Ben Wash or the Motorola sites here in Phoenix, um, all the litigation that went on, I was subpoenaed many times and my records from the Department of Health Services, my boxes of my file copies of all those memos that I'd written and the little bits of information, the sample results, uh, they, they were interested in them because they couldn't find all of that information at the Department of Health Services or they didn't want to go ahead and irritate the state government agency that regulated them. And so I was subpoenaed many times, whether it was uh, through toxic tort litigation, responsible parties, or whether it was the um, insurance companies fighting over who's, what share is it, Lloyd's of London and other companies. And it, you know, it went on uh, starting in, in 1985, 84, 85, all the way up to 2000, uh, to 2000 was the last time I was subpoenaed and, and appeared in court. And after that, I was grateful that I didn't have to do it, but it's, but I was the fact witness. Uh, but I was also uh, sort of an expert in that area at the beginning, you know, the, the, to explain um, what was happening because of the way the wastes were handled or disposed of, whether they were poured down dry wells, stormwater drainage wells into the sewer system, a leaky uh, underground storage tanks, all these things. You know, I said, I remember one of the sites wasn't in Tucson, but the they said, oh, this is great. We never have to drain it and have it pumped. And then all the waste was being poured into the tank and then it was went out the bottom and it had rusted out and it was going into the uh, environment and contaminating. Well, they're paying today to clean it up. And I drive by the uh, main treatment plant today for that contamination in East Phoenix. All right, Denise. Yeah. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about what we're discussing. Well, we were talking about litigation and what was my role. And I'd been contacted several times uh, by various parties, either responsible parties or plaintiffs uh, and defendants, uh, could I be a fact witness in the case? And once they got into it, I said, you know, I did a lot of the initial field work and the discovery work of, of the contamination and the sampling of the contaminated waters or the soils. And they realized that, no, they couldn't have an expert that was also a fact witness. It wasn't appropriate because, you know, how would that look uh, under under testimony that, you know, well, your fact witness is also your expert witness for your side and not the other side. And so I wasn't hired, but I was repeatedly subpoenaed 
to be a fact witness about what did you discover where and what did you do. And so I, I spent quite a bit of time in depositions, days on end, uh, for some of the toxic tort litigations. And there were very few federal or uh, state actions where I appeared. And do you still keep up with the Superfund site, the Tucson Superfund site? Well, you know, it was in, in the uh, 1980s, uh, I think it's appropriate to tell this story, that I, I, I was uh, working with uh, a number of environmental groups that were concerned about uh, contamination and groundwater contamination. And uh, they had started a uh, citizen's initiative uh, to uh, clean up groundwater. And it started, it created, eventually created the Department of uh, of environmental quality. But during that time, uh, Superfund uh, was expiring, and so we wanted to have it reauthorized. And uh, at that time, uh, John McCain was our congressman, and my office was in downtown Tempe, and uh, Congressman McCain's office was in downtown Tempe. So we all met at my office, walked across the street to McCain's office, and, and, uh, talked to him about reauthorization of Superfund. And he said, well, what are these sites like? And so we went to one here in the Indian Ben Wash area. And we were also here in, in North Tempe, which today is Tempe Marketplace. But at that time, it was a large open dump and a lot of contamination. The, the garbage was uh, decaying, creating explosive gases and toxic gases, and they had signs, no smoking, beware of poisonous gas. He said, somebody ought to do something about that. And we said, exactly, reauthorize uh, RICRA or uh, CERCLA. And so he did, and that, in that reauthorization then was the community involvement program that started. And uh, later on, I did more work for some of the contaminated uh, areas in, in, uh, in Indian Ben Wash, and in particularly with Motorola 52nd Street uh, as their expert. But again, without the money to sample, we, we relied upon the responsible parties or the, or the agencies to do that work. And then the, the agencies didn't have a lot of money. And so the responsible parties would do enough work to drag in somebody else to help pay for the cleanup. And that's exactly what happened in, in I think, in Tucson Airport area, from my understanding of what went on. It certainly happened up here in the Phoenix area and in the Indian Ben Wash area. And so were you a technical assistant to any of the TAG grants for the community? Uh, I was uh, here in, in the Motorola 52nd Street site but not down in Tucson. And, um, you know, I don't know if anybody contacted me or asked me to, if I wanted to do that or not. And it's, it's a long way, <laughs> you know. It's, and and I'm, I'm just, I, I just don't remember in those early days of the TAG grants, but I did work here in, in the, quite a bit in the Phoenix area. And it, it, whether it helped the neighborhoods or not, they certainly understood what was going on and the stakes that were there, and they couldn't sell their property. They couldn't couldn't get money uh, lent to them to improve their properties, and so it, it was an issue. And thinking back on your work and experience at the Tucson Superfund site, and maybe even the Motorola Fifty Second and Indian Ben Wash, what would you like to see future generations learn from this experience? Well, I think your actions uh, always ha have consequences. You hope they're all positive, that that builds and it, it restores and, and that it helps uh, your community and yourself and your family. But there's also things you just can't ignore it. And it's like that funny noise you hear when you're driving your car. What's that funny noise? You don't turn up the radio louder to drown it out. You try and find out what it is and get it fixed before the wheel falls off and you crash. There, you know, things have consequences. And I think just throwing your garbage or your waste the easiest way is not the safest way. And I think that that's what I'd like people to learn, that they're, they can impact the environment. It's not just... You know, should we reduce our carbon footprint? 
but we should be more responsible about the materials we use. And I think we've seen a change in the, in the variety of household chemicals that we use, cleaning products, uh, how we uh, grow our food, how we uh, prepare it. Those things have all changed as a result of, you know, little things can make a difference. And how would you like your memory of the work and the experience that you had to be remembered? Well, I'd like to, all of my actions that I did in, in the environmental arena to have a positive impact of making it better, to, that so nobody else gets hurt, nobody else uh, dies from the contamination or gets ill or has birth defects or all of those things. And we have done things... Uh, trying to be beneficial, uh, whether it's to use pesticides to drive out uh, pests that destroy the cotton crops, or whether it's to use defoliants in areas um, so that we can increase the, uh, well, in Vietnam we used it for, for the safety and security reasons so we could see through the jungle canopy but it contaminated and, you know, Agent Orange, uh, we also used it in Arizona to improve the watersheds in some areas, and, but it also, we saw impacts to the, to, the, uh, to the wildlife and those sort of problems. And so things have consequences. So whether when we start changing the landscape in the large uh, numbers and large degree, it may be beneficial in the short run and it may be have unintended consequences. So it needs to be studied further before we go out and do some of this stuff. And how do you think that the memory of the Superfund site in Tucson and its related contamination is going to be remembered? Well, I think it was one of the early test cases. Uh, in the early days, the federal government said, Arizona, you can pick two sites that we can focus on. And so we picked the Tucson Airport area, and we put, picked an area up here in Phoenix or, or the Mountain Park of Stakes and Globe. I forget which one. But uh, so Tucson Airport area was one of the first ones. So it's been around the longest. Uh, there's groundwater is very important in Tucson, uh, sole source aquifer. And even though we have Central Arizona Project water coming to Tucson, it's not of the chemical quality that is can easily be used. And so it's not being used directly in, in the older parts of town because it creates a problem. Have anything that you want to talk to you or have, I guess, mostly like you have a message for a community member specifically on your work or your experience with the site? Well, I, I think it's important to be involved. And uh, what I learned from using, uh, working with the technical assistance grant up here in, in, at the Motorola site was that people needed to understand that things can't be fixed overnight, but we have to understand what it is. And it takes time and it takes effort. And so you, you can't just force that to happen particularly when we start doing investigation of the subsurface and the drilling. And I still do drilling today as, as a geologist. For, and it just takes time to get the clearance, get the equipment, get, figure out where you're going to sample, what are you going to look at, what are you trying to discover, how are you going to design. It just takes time. And, but you need to stay involved and saying, have a regular reporting cycle or it just gets kind of forgotten. And so you need to, to be engaged. You just can't send your kid to school and then check 12 years later, well, what did they learn? You check that backpack every day. You check and see on a quarterly basis or an annual basis, whatever it happens to be, how are they doing? How are they learning? And you do the same thing with your community. How are we doing? You know, is it improving? Are we having better quality water? Are we having less uh, breaks in our water lines? Uh, or how, you know, the sewage, how's it being treated? 
all of those things. It's important. Are we making progress? Or are we just hiding from making those improvements? Be consistent. You have to be that squeaky wheel so that people get things done. And you have to do it in a way that is not nasty, but saying, I'm concerned. How can I help and help you do your job or you help me, you know, give me some training and guidance so I can help. And that is much better than just yelling and screaming. And I've been in a lot of public meetings my career and uh, it's some of them are uh, exciting and some of them are not. And some of them are just plain useless meetings where we just yell at each other for therapy. And did the Superfund site or all your experience with environmental or Superfund sites, did it change your behavior when it came to pollution in your community or your household? Yes. Um, um, I don't, uh, although I buy uh, bottled water in, in the plastic, in, you know, the half liter containers because I do a lot of field work and I need something that I can take to the field. I don't buy big tanks of water that's delivered by the truck and those sort of things because I'm just not very confident on the safety and the security and the cleanliness of that product that's delivered that way. So I choose not to do that, but I do use a, a uh, countertop filter to filter out forest fires in Arizona that in our, our uh, Salt River, Verde River system, that has a lot more uh, buildup of organic compounds, uh, naturally occurring compounds, and it, I don't like the taste. And although I drink it, but I still think the safest thing is usually uh, drinking the water right out of the tap. And so that's what I do. I drink it out of the tap. I don't like the drinking fountains because sometimes the uh, plumbing in that has some lead solder or some other metal taste. And, I, and the water is more acidic or whatever, and the chemistry changes the taste. And so I tend not to do that. So I'll drink bottled water. And is there anything else that you'd like to comment on that I left out or I forgot to ask you on your personal history with the Superfund site? No, I, I think one of, the, one of the things that I saw recently was the number of people employed in journalism and in media, uh, whether it's electronic or print, is about half of what it was a decade ago. And I think, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we had a lot of little small newspapers, a lot of hungry reporters looking for stories, asking questions, doing investigation. So there were a lot of reporters that went out and did work. Jane Kay was just one of those, did a lot of background research. But there were other reporters that did things in other small newspapers. Well, those small newspapers are gone. And the bigger um, television stations and radio stations used to get interviewed a lot and uh, among these things, but not so much anymore. And I don't see that coverage in the newspapers or on TV. 